Jesus all of our praise this morning. Hallelujah.
speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus To every good addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing is light. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like Depression, I speak Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is light. Break every stronghold. Jesus. 
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak your holy name, Jesus. Come on, somebody. I love to shout Jesus from the mountain. It don't matter where I go. I could be working in my barber shop. I could be at Walmart. Somebody trying to run me over at Walmart. That's a true story. But you know what? In the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray for you anyway. We have a good God. We have a great, great God. You might be saying, Pastor, Pastor Charlie, I'm going through a mess right now. But you know what? You are not alone. Our great God is with you. Y'all please just sing a little bit. I feel God's not done yet. He's not done yet. There's a move of God in this place. And he wants us just to surrender to him. If somebody came in here right now and pointed a gun, you would probably that's a surrender. That's surrender to God right now. Your name is love. There's power in the name of Jesus. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Oh, your name, your name is power. Oh, it's it's going to hold for chains falling right now. Let's clap our hands and thank him. Let's give him praise. The Bible says, by his stripes, we are healed. We are healed. We are delivered. Uh, you know what? I used to suffer with PTSD, post-traumatic stress. I say all the time, I was a hot mess. Now I'm just a mess. But you know what? I fought depression. I fought all of that negative stuff coming against me. But I'm here to tell you, we have a God of deliverance. We have a God of the Almighty. Amen. That's why I get excited. I ain't just trying to pump y'all up. I know transformation happens. And I always say this. When your life changes, you start to affect people around you. How are you going to be the influence? You going to be a positive influence? Good or bad? I want to be a positive influence for the kingdom. Not just for whole church. For the kingdom. I want to see every one of y'all in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Oh, yes. Thank y'all, worship team. Oh, man, I'm just excited. Let's just pray. I want to pray one more time. I just... Let's just seal what just happened. Lord, we lift our voices to you right now, Lord. We just thank you for transformation that just happened. We just thank you for the healing that just happened, Lord. We pray, Lord, your word goes forth today. It don't just bounce off of us, but we receive it. And we're going to be doers of your word, Lord. We just thank you what you're doing. Maybe we're standing in the gap today for our family members. For our neighbors, Lord, we pray for their deliverance. We pray for their salvation. You know what, Lord? You're the King of the kings and Lord of lords. And we thank you. We thank you for the healing. We thank you for the transformation. And we thank you for this word to go forth. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. If you agree with that, say amen. Come on now. If you agree with that, say amen. All right. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you to the worship team. Carly was off today in St. Charles Light. Hey, we'll come do it. That was so awesome. Y'all could be seated. Because I've got to catch my breath. Come on, somebody. 
I just get excited. I mean, I, I, I heard 80,000 people get excited at a Saints game, you know? And the, the New Orleans Saints, I'd say they're pretty good, but that's not true this year for sure. But you know what? Our God is great. So you know what? We always like to measure things. Maybe your day's not going great, but that don't mean we don't have a great God. The thing is, God's working even when you don't see it. That's the glory of God. I want to welcome everybody. I'm Pastor Charlie. I'm the location pastor over here. If you don't know, we have two locations, St. Charles location and St. Charles Parish, and this one. Well, we're one church. We're one church, two locations, trying to put forth the mission with God put in Pastor Thomas. And you know what? We're going to reach this community and beyond. Amen? Because you know what? It's important. we got to go out and make disciples. But today, Pastor Jason, great man of God. I, I used to make jokes about him, but a couple, couple months ago, I'm not, I'm not going to pick on him no more because he probably beat me up, you know. He works out all the time. I'm just big. I'm big for nothing. Like my mama used to I quit, quit laughing, Mr. Dusty. I'm just big for nothing, you know. But Pastor Jason... Man, he, he seeks God, he fasts, and, and you know what? I know he's bringing a strong word, and just have to know this. Open your hearts and mind. It's not from him. It's from God. It's from, it's, we, we, we're here for a purpose and a reason. When I first started coming to church, I just thought everything was a coincidence. It's not. God draws us near. Amen? Amen. Pastor Jason, we love you. We thank you for being here today. Come on up. Come on, let's give God one more hand clap of praise all across the house. Come on, the Spirit of God is in this place, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Do you believe that? Of course you do, or you wouldn't have been here. You'd have been stayed in your bed this morning. But I'm in the house with some people I know that believe that there is a God that loves them and a God that is moving in this house today. Thank you so much, Pastor Charlie. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I want to give thanks to my Pastor Thomas for also uh, allowing me to be here to speak to you wonderful, beautiful people here today. But most of all, I want to give glory to God because it is God that makes this possible. I feel so unqualified every time I get up to speak. You know, I just really have to lean into God, and I always just, my prayer is always that whatever I say, God, let it be your word, and that if there's anything that I say that is contrary to your word or not, from you. I said, just let it go in one ear and out the other. So I give glory to God here today. I'm so humbled. I'm honored to be able to have this opportunity to speak to you all here this morning. Amen. All right. Love you. Appreciate you. Thank you again for being here this morning. I met a, a few of you Friday night here at the Family Fall Fest. That was an awesome time. Thank you to the, uh, Pastor Charlie and Thomas for putting that on. So vital and so important that we have opportunities like those just to be fellowshipping with one another, hanging out with one another, building relationships, getting to know each other. And the church exists because we want to make an impact on the community. That's why this church is here, right? We're just here to make an impact on your lives and to point people to the love of Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. Do we know the Lord and have we put our faith and trust in him? Amen. All right, awesome. I like to ask people to stand for the reading of the word. I won't keep you standing long. I'm going to read a, a couple of scriptures, then we're going to pray over the message, and then we can be seated. Praise God. If they would go ahead and put up Hebrews 11 and 1 for us, first scripture. And this is what it says. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Amen. Hebrews 11 and 6 says this, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Praise God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Lord, we know that it is you that has drawn us here, God. Everything is because of you and for you. And God, I pray that as I speak right now, Lord God, that I wouldn't say anything that is contrary to your word. Lord, if I do, God, if I say anything that's just of my own mind, will, or emotions, Lord, let it be erased from their hearts and their minds. But I pray, God, that as the word of God goes forth, as your scriptures go forth, Lord, that our hearts would be good soil, that it would take root, 
and that it would produce a fruit in our lives, that it would change us. And Father, I pray that we would have the courage to not just be a hearer of your word this morning, but Lord, that we would be a doer of your word. And all God's people said in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, give, give the Lord one more hand clap of praise before you're seated. Bless God. Amen. I'm going to speak from these scriptures here. The title of this message is, Faith is the Evidence. So first of all, let's talk about what is faith. Because there is a lot of different opinions. I, I think the most popular opinion about what faith is is just simply believing in something you can't see. And that is true. A lot of people think that faith is just some sort of uh, intellectual acknowledgement of something or that something exists. Or a lot of people will say that faith is, is really just something that you say. But what really is faith? Faith is simply a positive response to what the Word of God already says. Let me tell you something that faith is not. Faith is not something that we use to uh, twist God's arm or to make God do something for us that we want. Because we can have all the faith that we want to in something that is not the will of God and it's not going to happen. So I hope that you understand what I'm saying here. It's not that we just, oh, I have enough, I have all this faith that God's going to make me a millionaire. If that's not the will of God for my life, faith is not going to change that. Faith is simply believing what the Word of God says and believing what the promises of God says. And then we positively respond to that. Faith is not just something that we say. It's not just something that we think, but it's something that we do. Because when we operate in faith, it changes the way that we think. It changes the way that we talk, yes, but it also changes the way that we live. It changes the way that we perceive our relationship with God. It changes the way that we interact with other people around us. Praise God. You with me? Y'all quiet. Amen. So faith. It's simply just saying, you know what, God, if you said it, that settles it. I believe it. I'm going to live it out. I'm not just going to be a hearer of the word, but I'm going to be a doer. Now, I wasn't raised in church, okay? I was raised in a very ungodly household all of my life until I was 28 years old. And, of course, I always, you know, I had Christians that would come around to me and try to, you know, witness to me and tell me about God and all this stuff. And I would just be like, well, yeah, I mean, it sounds good, but I just, I just don't believe it. Or I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get it. And people would say things to me. Everybody, anybody ever had somebody say to you, even now in the church, you just got to have faith. You just got to have faith. Like it's just some button that I go and press. Oh, okay, well, now I have faith. But how do you have faith? How do you get faith? That is the important part that, a lot, sadly, a lot of churches, we don't teach that. We just say, oh, you just got to have faith. You just got to believe. Well, that's easy, but it's not that easy just to all of a sudden say, okay, well, I believe. Well, how do you get faith? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what does that mean? That does mean that, yes, faith comes from hearing the preached word of God, like you're hearing this morning, from reading your scriptures, from coming to church. But that's not the only ways that we can hear from God. You see, Hearing from God can come in so many different ways. This is why it's so important. One of the best ways that you're going to get faith is start coming to prayer. Start talking to God. Talking to a God that you can't see or that you can't hear. But if you'll do that in faith, God will begin to speak to you. That's how your faith can begin to grow and begin to build. Listening to worship music is another thing. Listening to the Word of God. Faith isn't just something that all of a sudden we're just walking along and God is just going to say, poof, and it's like some magic pill. We have to be intentional. But when you begin to seek God, faith will come. This is how we get faith. This is why it's so important that we come to church. This is so, why it's so important that we get involved in like small groups and communities. You get around people that are with, that have faith. Before I went to church, I didn't have faith. But it was something amazing about it when I started coming to church and I got around people that were in faith, my faith began to grow. I began to understand more about the Bible and the Word of God. It, it was amazing. All of a sudden, it was like my ears were open and I could hear God and I could see God in all these different aspects of my life that I never noticed before. And so this is how we get faith. Now, I'm going to go back to Hebrews 11 and 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. 
Now, I said that faith isn't just something that we think or something that we say. Because when we have true biblical faith, there is substance to that. What is substance? Something is, substance is something, yes, that can be measured. It is something that you can see. It is something that you can feel. So many people are struggling in their relationships with God and trying to understand God and trying to find God. And they're saying, well, I think I have faith. But they're not listening to the word of God. They're not obeying the word of God. They're not being faithful to the house of God. They're not putting themselves in that position for them to get the faith that God wants to put in them. You with me? Amen. So it's important because true biblical faith is going to produce a change. True biblical faith is going to produce a change in your heart, a change in your life, a change in your attitudes, a change in your situations, because there is substance to biblical faith. It is faith that is the evidence. My wife hates it, but I'm, all, I'm on TikTok all the time making all kind of videos and trying to reach people. And there's all these people that are, and not just on TikTok, but just in, in my life. I've dealt with so many people that say, well, where is your evidence for God? Right? They want scientific proof. Prove your God exists. What's your evidence? And you know what? I used to spend hours upon hours with these people. I mean, trying to uh, approach it from all the scientific uh, perspective, trying to talk about creation, talking about history, and all these things. And I finally realized, you know what? I'm just wasting my time. It's all futile. Because knowing God and having faith in God is not something that is learned through science. It's not something that is learned through history. And the truth is that it's not even an evidence problem or a proof problem. The problem is a spiritual problem. It is a heart problem. Because the Bible says that faith is the evidence, right? And they want the evidence before they have the faith, but then that's not faith. So I started telling them, I'm not going to sit here and try to prove to you that my God exists. He's already existed. I'm not going to use science and history and education and all these things that you're looking for as far as being evidence. Like I said, because if I do that, I'm really doing you a disservice because God is only pleased with faith. God is not uh, impressed or pleased with our education. You can have a PhD in biology. You can be a millionaire. You can have a nice boat, a nice house, a nice car, a great job. None of that pleases God. God is only pleased by faith. So I'm not trying to prove to them that God exists because it, without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God. And the only way to get faith is to get connected to God, to get connected to God's people, to get connected to the church. And without faith, it is impossible. And the second part of that scripture is so important. It says, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Oh, I love that. Probably not catching it. That believe that he is. Okay? Not he was, not he will be, but he is. Come on, he is the healer. He is the resurrection. He is your deliverer. He is your provider. Not he was, not he will be, but he is. He is the rewarder of those. And here's the key part that we overlook. Those that diligently seek him. Okay? We have to seek God with all of our heart. So what does that mean? That means, yes, being faithful to reading the Bible, being faithful to praying and having a relationship with God, being faithful to the house of God, being faithful to small groups, being faithful to listening to worship music and spending time praising and worshiping God, spending time with him. Come on, have any single people in here seeking a husband or a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Right? When we're dating, we're diligently seeking after that person. Right? When we fall in love with somebody, don't we diligently seek them? We're constantly on the phone, texting, buying flowers, all this stuff. I don't know what the young kids do now, but that's what we did. We had to actually talk on the telephone, not just text or FaceTime. Right? But when we diligently seek after something, when we really love something, when we really love that individual, Right, you diligently seek after them. It's all you think about. It's your whole day is consumed by it. You're writing their name on everything. All the silly stuff we used to do as kids. Right? You diligently seek. This is what God is saying. Diligently seek after me. Not half-heartedly, not just when it feels good, not just when it's convenient, but when you will dil diligently seek after God. The Bible says, "When you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me." Amen. Praise God. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
And so it's so vital and so important that we are constantly in the word of God, that we are constantly putting ourselves in a position to hear from God. This is the only way that we are going to have the faith that God desires for us to have. Now, I'm going to read the next scripture I'm going to read from is in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And this is what it says, okay? And just to give you a quick background, this is, this is right after that Jesus is ascending to heaven. He's, our, he's died, he was uh, buried, right, and he rose again on the third day. And then he went around and he, re- he showed himself to a few people, but then there's this, this time where Jesus is ascending back to heaven. And the Bible says that there was about 500 people there, and this is what Jesus tells them. It says, starting in verse 4, Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized you with water, but just in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. So real quick, think about it. They're asking Jesus. They're asking for evidence. They're asking for something specific. What is the date and the time that you're going to restore? But notice Jesus doesn't tell them. He said it's not for you to know because he wants them to walk by faith. He wants them to trust what he is telling them. So he doesn't specifically tell them, but he says, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. You see, having a relationship with God is not always just going to be based on what we know, but it's based on who we know. And we need to have faith. That is what pleases God. Faith is what gets God to move in our lives. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Anybody in here want some power? You want some power over the enemy? You want some power over the anxiety, over the fear, over the depression, over the sickness in your body? Don't you want some power over that pain that's in your body? Come on, power over your family, power over your finances, power over your life. Y'all quiet. I know that's the truth because they got a lot of power-hungry people out there, people seeking power in all sorts of ways. But God says, no, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So there's about 500 people, as I, as I stated. There's 500 people that hear this, that Jesus is talking to as he's ascending to heaven. Okay, And he's telling them, he tells them to go wait in Jerusalem. There's this upper room where Jesus tells them to go and wait. So many times we get so impatient with God. We say, God, I'm giving you five minutes. If it doesn't happen right now, I'm going to pray. And if my body still hurts, then I'm, then I'm moving on. God, I'll go to church a few times. But if nothing changes, nothing happens, we move on. But there was, there was 500 people, and only 120 had the faith to wait on God. These 120 people had the faith to listen to what Jesus said, right? They, didn't, they weren't just hearers of the word, but they were doers. They said, okay, God, I know this may not make any sense. I know I don't understand everything that's going on. Many of you might be thinking the same thing when we were up here worshiping. You're saying, I don't understand why you're lifting your hands. I don't understand why you're yelling and shouting and dancing. It doesn't make any sense. But I cannot tell you the reason that we do that is because faith is arising in our hearts. Because the Bible says, leap for joy. The Bible says, shout unto God with the mighty voice of Priam. The Bible says that lift your hands to heaven. We do that because we know that the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. I remember the first time I walked into an apostolic church. I looked a lot like some of y'all looking at people like, man, what is wrong with y'all people? Y'all is crazy. Y'all done lost y'all mind up in here. Y'all running around, jumping, smiling, laughing, clapping. I'm like, what is wrong with y'all people? Y'all is crazy. It didn't take long. It didn't take long before the Spirit of God got a hold of me. Come on. 
Now every service, I'm the crazy one out in front with people looking at saying, hey, what's wrong with that dude? I can't help it. There's just something when we start to sing about the uh, goodness of God and we start to sing praises to God, I just can't help it. It's like the Bible says, like this fire shot up in my bones, and I know that God inhabits the praises of his people. And I get up every Sunday morning, and I'll come to church because I want to encounter a living God, and I want to give God all the glory and the praise that he so deserves. And I don't care if it doesn't make sense in my human mind or if it looks foolish, but there's power in your praise. Praise is your weapon. I encourage you. I I know what it's like. I know what it's like to feel uncomfortable or feel embarrassed to want to lift your hands. I went through that for the first couple of months when I was in church. Even though everybody else around me was doing it, I was still something. It was probably the enemy or my flesh thinking, don't do that. You're going to look foolish. People are going to look at you like you're weird. But when I broke free from that, and when I began to worship and praise God, and that faith just began to arise, and things in my life and my circumstances began to change, because I became, became, began to become a doer of the word and not just hearers. So there's a, only 120 out of that 500 people had the faith to go to the upper room and to receive that promise that God had given them, the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you've never received that promise, today can be your day. And you may not really fully understand that. And you may not really fully grasp that. But I'm here to tell you that you need it. It's the only thing that's going to lift us up out of here is the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead can live in you. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. It's better than any power that anything on this earth can provide to you. It's better than any drug. It's better than any alcohol. It's better than any doctor. It's better than any prescription. Come on, it's better than any tarot card reading and all this other foolishness that people are seeking after for their peace and their deliverance and the power that they want in their lives. It is the almighty God living inside of you. But it's going to take faith. You're going to have to step out in faith and believe that what the word of God says is for you. And that God is who he says he is. And then we're going to have to diligently seek after him because he will reward you if you will do that. Amen. Praise God. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. Think about that. Only 120 out of 500. They literally saw Jesus. They knew he had been crucified. They literally had saw Jesus ascending to heaven. And he said, all he tells them, just go and wait in this upper room. The promise is coming. And only 120 had the faith to do it, the willingness to do it. It's so sad that those others, what is that, uh, 380, right? Is my math right? Come on, you. 380 people missed out on the greatest gift that God could ever bestow upon them because they just didn't have enough faith. Maybe they they were thinking, well, I I don't have 10 days. Maybe, oh, I got to get back to my job. I got to go fix my house. I got to cut my grass. I got to wash my car. I got to go to work, and I just don't have time. And they missed out. But those 120 that received the word of God and not just heard it, but then they actually obeyed it. So they're in the Acts Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 4, if they'll put that up. We're going to read about the fulfillment of this promise. Now, before we go to this next portion of Scripture, I want to share this again with you, that faith, faith is the evidence. I talk to you about the people that are always looking for some sort of scientific evidence, historical evidence, or whatever for God. But the Bible says that faith is the evidence. And here's why. Because when we begin to operate and we begin to move in faith, when we begin to believe in faith, that's when the miracles, signs, and wonders happen. That's when you begin to see what God is promising in the word of God actually become uh, real into our lives. And we begin to see all the promises of God begin to manifest in our life. And that's what we should all desire. That's why faith is the evidence. But we can't expect the evidence before the faith. That's the problem. Bible says that blessed is he that has uh, believed and has not seen. Can you believe? Can you step out in faith and believe what God is saying? Because everything that God does, that, that scripture says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. We all have hopes in our life. But faith is the evidence of things that aren't seen. None of us here has physically seen God. None of us can see 
God physically healing our body, right? None of us can see the fruit of the Spirit with our physical eyes at first because everything that God does begins in the Spirit. So what we have to do is we have to use faith to bring what God promised in His Word, what God is doing in the Spirit, to use faith to bridge that gap, to bring it into this world. And when we'll do that, if we get in a house full of people, full of faith, I'm telling you, miracles, signs, and wonders begin to break out. Worship begins to break out. When I was 28 years old, I walked into a church similar to this in Metairie, Louisiana. Okay? I didn't have a whole, hardly any scriptural knowledge. I told you I was raised in a terrible home, terrible lifestyle, it was just ungodly. Everything that you can think of happened. Every kind of abuse that you could do to somebody, I experienced. And I walked into a church. I wasn't full of faith. I had no intentions on giving my life to God or anything. My life was a disaster. My life was a wreck. I was in the middle of a divorce. I had kids that I had to be separated from. I had lost my job because I, the, the girl that I was married to, her dad owned the business. And she said, that he can't work for you no more. And so I, financially, my life was a mess. My credit was a mess. My, my, I was angry. I had bitterness and all this resentment for my mom. I never knew my real biological dad. I still don't know him to this day. And I was going through life carrying all this stuff around, all this weight, all this baggage, all this hurt, all this anger. And I was just thinking, man, I, I, either I'm going to end up in jail because I was so angry at everybody or I'm just going to end up taking my own life. I couldn't take it anymore. And my sister invites me to church for Easter Sunday. And the message that was preached was called, there was a real hell. And I was like, wow. You see, Hollywood has this great way, and uh, entertainment has this great way of desensitizing us to all this stuff. Like all this Halloween that's coming up tomorrow, all these people with all these ghosts and skeletons and skulls and all this crazy stuff in their yard, and I'm not condemning anybody. But I'm just telling you that we see all that now. We think, oh, it's just Halloween. It's kids. It's candy, right? Every, uh, Hollywood portrays this image of Satan as this, you know, this guy with horns running around with a pitchfork, and we become desensitized to it. And we don't really think, man, hell is a real place. Well, there really are demons. Like, there really is an enemy that's out for my soul. Right? We become desensitized to it because we just hear it. The enemy just bombards it with us. And we think, oh, it's just made up stuff in movies. So it, I just, all of a sudden, I was like, man, there is a real hell. And I got convicted. And I was like, man, I thought about all the times that God sent people to talk to me and to witness to me. And I was, you know, like one of those, you know, cool dudes like, I don't want to hear all that, bro. I ain't got time for all that. Whatever, that's foolishness, bro. I don't need nobody to tell me how to live. I don't need nobody's help. I got this on my own. I don't want to hear all that. I began to get convicted, and I was like, man, God, God, I was rejecting you, rejecting your love, and I got convicted, and I, at the end of that service, I came to the front, and I just began to say, God, I'm sorry. I you know what? At that point, I wasn't even st still really sure if God really even existed. But I just began to say, God, if you're real, God, forgive me. I'm sorry that I've rejected you. I'm sorry I've rejected the people that you sent to me. But the message didn't stop there because he told me about the love of Jesus Christ that would set me free. And he told me that God loved me so much that he prepared a place for me to be with him for eternity in heaven. That I didn't have to go there. But that, that was my choice. I was choosing to do that. And I was broken. I was literally broken before God. And I repented. And then it was only a week later that I walked into a same church, Sunday, Sunday night service. They were singing praises. They were worshiping and praising God. And everybody was at the front. The preacher didn't even get a chance to come and preach. I'm sitting on the front row on the right, on the, about right over there in that church. And the pastor's son comes over to me, and a couple other guys come over to me, and they said, Jason, have you ever received the Holy Spirit? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't even really know. What, what, what do you mean? What does that even mean? And he said it pretty plainly, basically. It's just really the Spirit of God coming to live inside of your heart. Yeah, you can have power over all this, this hurt and heartache and all this stuff that's going on in your life. And as, he's like, do you want that? Do you mind if I pray for you? I said, no, uh, yeah, that sounds awesome. That sounds wonderful. Who would, who would reject that if somebody's telling you that you can have power, that you don't have to be depressed, that you don't have to be angry, you don't have to rock around with unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and be addicted to all manner of things? Like, 
I don't know why anybody rejects that. And so I was like, sure, pray for me. I stand up. They begin to pray. I mean, literally within about a minute to a minute and a half, I just began to pray in this heavenly language. We call it speaking in tongues. I couldn't have quoted scriptures about it. I couldn't have told you what it meant. All I know is that I had a supernatural encounter and experience with God. All I can tell you is that from that moment on, that I had breakthrough, that I had healing, that I had deliverance, that I had the power of God living inside of me. How did all that happen? Because of just a little bit of faith. I said, I don't know, God. I'm just going to step out in faith. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm not asking for evidence. I'm just going to surrender to you, God, and I'm going to let faith be the evidence. And this is why it's so important that you're connected to a church. Because when we begin to operate in faith, when you get around a bunch of believers that are walking by faith, you can get healing, you can get deliverance, because the Spirit of God inhabits the praises of his people. And now that I've been doing this thing for about 20 years, now I have the scriptures to back up the encounter and the experience and everything that God did for me. We're going to see this in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So this is after the, 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 they've been in the upper room praying for about 100, I mean, excuse me, for about 10 days. This is the 120 that had that faith to believe in something they couldn't see and they couldn't understand. And they go into the upper room, and this is what the Bible says. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house. Right, And then cloven tongues appeared unto them like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Faith. This is the evidence of their faith. You see, they had the faith to trust what God told them. And then they, their faith is what allowed what God was doing in the Spirit to come into their physical life. They began to see the manifestation and the power of God filling them with the Holy Spirit. This is the birth of the New Testament church. But it takes faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. What was the difference between the 120 and the 380? It was just a little bit of faith. God says, if you draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. The story of the prodigal son. We all, that's one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. We all know it. It says that the, the boy was with the father. He had all kind of riches and everything. He says, give me my inheritance. He goes out. He spoils it all. He ruins his life. He wrecks his life. He ends up eating out of pig slop. And then he says, man, even the servants in my father's house are better than what I'm living here. And as soon as that, that child says, you know what, I'm going to go back to the father. It says, the Bible says, this is so awesome. If this doesn't encourage you, I don't know what does. Because if you feel far away from God, maybe you've never experienced God. Maybe you've never really felt God. Maybe all this still seems a little strange to you. The Bible says that while the boy was still afar off, that the father was filled with compassion. And that the father began to run to his son. And he wrapped his arms around him. And he gave him a big old hug. And he gave him a big old kiss. He didn't condemn him. He didn't beat him down and say, oh, you, you spoiled everything that I gave you. But he was filled with compassion. And if you can just turn to God in faith and believe in faith, God can fill you today with the Spirit of God. It is his will and is a desire for your life. And where the Spirit of God is, there's liberty and there's freedom. You can have power over anxiety, fear, depression, pain, and sickness in your body. How do we do that? We simply just walk by faith and say, God, I don't have to understand it. And when we have true biblical faith, it's going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to encourage you real quick, and I'm almost finished. When we read the Bible and we read about the promises of God, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but I've done it so many times, right? You read something in the Scriptures, right? It says, ask and you shall have. Seek and you shall find. And you're like, well, God, I did ask. And we just say, it didn't happen. But when you understand that God says that the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And so you have to understand that we are spirit, soul, and body. Okay? There's more to you than just your physical body. There's more to you than just your soul. But there is a spirit aspect. It is the spirit that gives life. And so everything that God does is in the spirit. 
Now, it's our responsibility to simply respond in faith and believe what the Word of God says and to understand that the spirit realm is just as real as this physical realm. And so when we have biblical saving faith, we can take what God is doing and wants to do in the spirit and bring it into pass in this life. And right now, God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, you don't want to leave out of here without being full of the Spirit of God. And the musicians can come. I'm almost done. I shared with you a little bit of my testimony. I don't know what you're, where you're at in your knowledge and understanding of God. I don't know all the situations. I don't barely know any of y'all in here. I don't know what you're struggling with here today, whether it's insecurity, whether it's fear, whether it's pain in your body, whether it's worry, whether it's doubt, whether it's unforgiveness. Maybe you're holding a grudge against somebody that's hurt you. Maybe you're carrying around the heartache of the abuse of, that people have done to you, whether it's physically, you know, you know, emotionally. I don't know what you're going through, but I can tell you this much, that you're no different than I am. I'm no better than anybody else. I came into the kingdom of God with absolutely felt like nothing to offer God. Had no money, no job. I was a wreck. My emotions were terrible. Bound by all sort of stuff, alcohol, drugs, all that stuff that you know that goes on in our world. So I had literally nothing to offer God, is what I thought. But then God said, No, you have what I want more than anything. It's your heart. I just want your heart. I just want you to trust me. I just want you to. Seek after me and believe that I love you. Believe that I will do what I said I will do. And that's all he wants from you here today.